Got Titles podcast is proud to be sponsored by Land Trust Title Services, your partners for results. To everyone, welcome. My name is Steve Kempf with Land Trust Title Services, and I'm here with some of my colleagues from Land Trust. We have Matt Lombardi and we have Tony Zielinski. Uh, Matt's our senior marketing manager. Tony's our vice president of sales. And we're really pleased today to have um, two people that I think are really going to provide insight and give you some helpful tools on how you can really make an impact with your clients. And that's Stephanie Park and Scott Longstreet. Uh, so Stephanie and Scott, welcome. And thank you for being with us today. Um, for yeah. what I want to say is that we do want this to be conversational. So if you have a question, you can just uh, type it into the uh, Q&A or to the chat, and we'll address those as we go along. Um, but I met uh, Stephanie and Scott uh, through a very good law firm that we work with, Land Trust, often. And they had told me that they um, refer all of their uh, tax uh, you know, and any tax challenges to this, uh, uh, to Scott and Stephanie. And when I met with them, uh, I was really impressed with their background. Uh, over 25 years ago, they were sitting on the side where they were listening to uh, these cases of tax appeals and, you know, passing judgment, yay or nay on it. And then in 19... 96 is was it 96 you guys started stephanie and scott 2000 oh 2000 okay so in 96 you guys were uh you starting as judges in 2000 they decided to start their own practice where they are helping people uh you know appeal their taxes and since then they have done thousands and thousands and thousands of tax appeals successfully and, uh, you know, they do 5,000 or so a year. So they are, in, in my estimation, I've been around a little bit. They are, in my estimation, the aficionados in this space. So as a service to our agents, uh, our real estate agents, and as a service to our, the real estate community, we thought, hey, let's get them on. Let's have them talk about the process. Let's have them field questions and um, make them available as a resource. So why don't we begin? I'll turn it over to Stephanie and Scott. Stephanie, Scott, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. So ladies so, first, I guess. <laughs> yes. So I am my, my, I'm Stephanie, and I am going to present the basic, um, inf some basic information on how property taxes are calculated and the importance of knowing when properties are reassessed. So moving on to that first slide, um, on the next one after. Do we see, is, do you guys see the one that says agenda? No, not, not the agenda. The one after that, this one. Okay, um, great. So <clears throat> looking at this, property taxes are supposed to be calculated on a percentage of market value. And this will determine the assessment. And they multiply, the assessment is multiplied by a state equalization factor and the tax rate to determine your base property taxes. As you can see, the assessed value here is the, the biggest um, number that impacts your property tax bills. And that's what we can help appeal. And so, in different counties, they reassess properties every three to four years. In this example, this is for a residential property in Cook County where properties are assessed, residential properties are assessed at 10% of market value. So if you purchase a home for a million dollars, it's multiplied by 10% and the assessed value is $100,000. Cook County, um, the equalization factor is close to three and the tax rate, let's say average is 10%. So that equates to a $30,000 tax bill for a residential property and that is purchased for a million dollars. So 
moving on to the next slide. So Stephanie, just to, to pause you here, just simple, um, simple guy. So what the driver behind all these, the numbers that are static are uh, all the numbers below the market value value. Is that right? And so what you're actually challenging when you're making a challenge uh, to the uh, taxes is the assessed market value of the property. Yes. The equalization okay. factor and tax rates do change every single year. Right. But there's no challenge to that. Those no. are things that they decide on that are the common denominator for everyone else. The variable is that top number, that market value number. That's the one that you go after. Or the assessed value, we we challenge the assessment. Okay, so you uh, oh, so the assessed value, so you challenged a hundred thousand number, which is yes. really driven by the top line number. Is that right? It is, but okay. there's several. There's there's two ways to argue property taxes. One is market value, and the other way is um, lack of uniformity, where we say. It doesn't matter what the market value is on this home. If every property in your neighborhood is under assessed by 50%, you have a right to be equally under assessed by 50%. And so that's where we're um, appealing the assessed value. I see, interesting. Yeah. Okay, great. So do we wanna move on to the next? Uh... Yes, please. Okay, great. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm fighting a cold. Um, so moving on to this next slide, <clears throat> this shows how and when um, properties are reassessed. So I'm gonna go with the collar counties first because it's it's simpler. Um, collar counties, anything that's non-cook is what we call collar counties. They are reassessed every four years. All properties in the Collar County is assessed at 33% of market value. Doesn't matter if it's residential, industrial, a fact, car wash, it doesn't matter. Um, and the impact of the reassessment is spread out into both tax bills. So there's not one tax bill where there's going to be a sticker shock. Now, moving on to Cook County, they like to be a little different, a little special, and they reassess properties every three years. Um, it's divided into three different sections, Cook County is. So this year in 2024, all properties in the city of Chicago was reassessed. So that's what we're fighting now. Then next year, it'll be all properties in the North and Northwest suburbs will be reassessed. And then the following year, 2026, the south suburbs will be reassessed and the cycle continues until you're in it for 25 years. Um, and then they also like to do things a little differently here again, and they do it on a classification system. Like I said previously, residential property is assessed at 10% of market value. Commercial and industrial property is assessed at 25% of market value. Um, and this 10% rule could be very helpful for for realtors. Um, for example, if a, if a client is trying to purchase a property where the taxes seem a little high, you can tell them, hey, it's supposed to be assessed at 10% of market value. So you can always appeal these taxes after you've purchased the property. On the reverse side, on the flip side, you can spin it a different way. Um, a client's looking at a property and, and they're on the fence, you can say, hey, you know what? You're buying a million dollar property, but you're being assessed as if it's worth $800,000. So the property taxes are really low for this type of property and you're getting a, a bargain. Um, so that's how the classification system, knowing how Cook County and how properties are, um, how the assessor's office assesses property can help you keep your clients informed on what happens with these property taxes and their purchase price and how it impacts it. The biggest- Stephanie, Stephanie I, I have a question. Uh, uh -huh. um, so in your previous example, where you said that the, the property was a million dollars and mm -hmm. they were assessed at 10% for $100,000 and you said you can, you can contest either on the market value 
or you can contest on the assessed value. And then you said if all the rest of the homes in the neighborhood are assessed 50% below the one that you're appealing, that you can make that argument. Is the reason that they're assessed 50% below is because their market value is been deemed less, right? Is that right? No, um, not necessarily. So I don't know if I said, but so technically assessors are supposed to assess property based on market value. Obviously, yes. it's very difficult to determine market value on millions of properties. So the assessor's office does everything on a mass appraisal system, all computer generated. And so the assessment process and market values are not accurate or perfect. So because of that, you can make the argument for market value. Um, and sometimes there is that argument, that argument can be made. But the most common argument is lack of uniformity or inequity in the assessment process. And so we take whichever, whichever yields the lower um, assessed values. I see. Okay. That's, I think that's really helpful. That, that I think uh, spells it out great. So yeah. the biggest opportunity is not just on the market value and just making that simple calculation, the big opportunity and where you guys have a lot of great insight is taking a look at these assessed values of like properties in that neighborhood and then being able to articulate the argument saying, Hey, listen, look at these assessments of properties all around that are kind of like three bedroom, whatever it is. And, you know, let's get the same assessment here. And almost then market value gets thrown out the window or kind of at least the impact of it is diminished, right? Right. It's either or. It's not an either or. You can make both arguments. So okay. you can have a market value argument. You can have um, an, a lack of uniformity argument. Most of our clients, it would be a lack of uniformity argument. I would say major 80% of our okay, clients. Okay, another, another question someone has is by default, does Cook County use the most recent sales price to set market value of a property? No, because um, they're reassessing based on the last, since the last reassessment cycle. So for City of Chicago clients right now, they were reassessed in 2021. So they're looking at what happened to market value since the last reassessment of January 1, 2021. Okay, so if there was a sale of a property in the last three years, does that is that what dictates the market value or how do they determine the market value there? That. Yeah, let me step in. Stephanie's like, she said she, she's suffering from a cold. Is sure. No, they, they should not base it uh, only on that sale price. Um, that's what we call sale chasing in the property tax industry. That's not allowed. And that's essentially why you have the uniformity section of it, because they could chase sales and, and put this person at the million and a half that they bought it for, this person at a million two five. But it's not fair if all the other similar houses that haven't sold recently are being at, put at a million. And so they should not put it exactly at its purchase price. What they're trying to do in a mass appraisal system is take all the sales and come up with values for different properties based on their characteristics, location, et cetera, but they should not be sale chasing. And that's what Stephanie was alluding to that, you know, as a taxpayer, you got the benefit of both arguments. If they didn't chase my sale and I actually bought it for less, let me do an, let's do an appeal and get it reduced. If they, um, you know, have me for uh, less than my purchase price, but you're still out of whack uniformly, you can go in and say, well, yeah, I may be worth more than you have me value, but I should be valued the same as similar properties. So they should not be chasing sales and there are avenues to pursue if they are. Okay, so it's nuanced and generally speaking, this kind of casting a wide net system is not to the taxpayer's advantage, typically. Um, it might be, but generally speaking, uh, if I had to make errors, I'd make errors on my upside as opposed to your upside type of thing. Yeah, right. That's exactly right. And you're, you have the opportunity to argue it either way. Great. Okay. Sorry, I just uh, thank you for clarifying that. We were on this, uh, on the Cook County side of things. Okay. 
<clears throat> to continue, the biggest impact and difference is that um, Cook County Assessor's Office, this reassessment is only reflected on the second installment tax bill. So increases, exemptions, all of that shows on the second installment tax bill. The first installment tax bill is merely 55% of the prior year's taxes. So we're gonna have some clients this year where their second installment tax bill may be double or triple what they had anticipated because of these reass this reassessment. By the time that tax bill arrives in their mailbox next year, it's too late to appeal. And that's why it's so important for um, everyone to know that when reassessments occur, what the deadlines are, and that the, you can file an appeal as soon as you purchase that home. Um, right now in 2024, half the townships are already closed and there's still, and, and you can't just look at the assessor's website to look at um, the reassessment deadlines because there's three different levels to file an appeal. There's the assessor, most of that is already closed. Um, and then there's the second level, which is the board of review where half the townships are still open. And then there's the Illinois Property Tax Appeal Board where Scott and I were hearing officers. So knowing when these deadlines are, or just the general idea of it, I think could really be helpful to your clients. Um, <clears throat> and then going, I'd like to also throw in a bonus section of the exemptions, which is the, I think the next slide, um, where I think you can, as realtors can add a, a very simple um, free service added, a value added service to clients. So you will, <clears throat> We have so many clients who call us, potential clients who recently purchased, you know, in 2022, 23, and we do the research and um, and they're missing the homeowner's exemption. And we ask them, you know, you, how come you didn't file? And they just don't know that there's that this exemption is available to them. So it's a simple way to build repertoire with the uh, with your clients. Um, so the first most common one is the homeowner's exemption, and that's just merely this, you're going to be using this as your primary residence, and you're the title home owner, and um, you're not going to be claiming a homeowner's exemption on any other property. Then you can save up to $10,000 of equalized assessed value times the tax rate every year. So for Cook County client, for City of Chicago clients, it could be seven, $800 a year for um, Northern clients, it could be a thousand to $1,200 a year. And for the sub South suburban clients, we've seen homeowners exemptions of 2000 to $4,500 every year because their tax rates are astronomical. The second um, most common one is the senior citizens exemption. You have to meet the homeowner's exemption qualifications and you have to be 65 years old um, during that property tax cycle. Doesn't matter if you turn 65 in December of 2024, you can still qualify for it. And that equates to $8,000 times the local tax rate. And then there's the senior citizen freeze exemption where you meet these other requirements but your total household income is less than $65,000 a year. The purpose of this exemption was to allow um, low-income senior citizens to be able to stay in their homes despite rising market values. Um, the big nuance here is that you have to live in that home every um, two years prior to qualifying for this exemption. I had a senior citizen who um, was downsizing. They were receiving the freeze in their prior home and had pretty low in, um, property taxes. Then they downsized and thought that they would reduce their property taxes even further and get it frozen. It didn't happen because by the time they purchased it and then they it was reassessed, property taxes kind of came out to even by the time that they had to wait the two-year cycle. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to cover on that one. Oh, the timing of this. So the 
exemptions are, so the property taxes are paid one year in arrears. So the exemption forms come out the next year. So the senior citizen freeze exemption, if you if you're, have a client that's going to buy, be buying a home with a senior citizen freeze exemption, um, there's no guarantee that that will be there for the tax bill that they will be receiving credit for and they will have to pay. Mm -hmm. So because they do not file for this exemption until the following year. So for 2024, you file in February or March of 2025 after your client has already paid, um, has already purchased the property. So sometimes you can work that out in contract negotiations um, to say that they will apply for this senior citizen freeze exemption so that, and, and, and or receive the proper credit for it. And okay, so uh, uh, just to clear, so the senior freeze is 65 too, right, Stephanie? Yeah, 65 years of age and total household income has to be 65,000 or less. Okay, and just to clarify, um, with the, uh, with you qualifying for it on, you know, and making sure you get it, are you talking about that if a senior who qualifies for the senior freeze purchases a property, they then have to apply for it to be, and it might be a little bit of a delay, right? Is that what you're talking about? Right. So all these exemptions, um, when you first purchase a property, it, it that property, if even if it was getting the exemption previously, when when there's it changes a transfer, hands, it disappears, and so you have to reapply. Um, the homeowner's exemption and the senior citizen's exemption, once you start receiving it, it automatically renews. But the senior citizen freeze exemption, because it's income-based, you have to reapply for that every single year based on your income. I see. It doesn't mean that you will always qualify. And okay, great. And that's a great thing to look into if you're buying a property, a younger person buying a senior property. It's a great thing to look into because um, when you're looking at those taxes, uh, it could be impacted by the senior freeze or whatever, and they're going to go up on you. Right. And I've seen senior freeze exemption credits as high as twenty twenty five thousand dollars. So it could be a huge impact depending yeah. on, on how how and when they started qualifying for this. Okay. Um. Great. Thank you. Uh, next uh, slide. Yep. All right. I will be taking over from here. And so I'm going to address a few topics that uh, may impact the your client's property tax bill after they purchase it and how to be leery of them and ready for them and, and advise your clients. Uh, the first thing is new construction. So your client's looking to buy a newly constructed house. Uh, the current tax bill is maybe $1,000, $2,000 because it's just land value. So when are they going to get impacted by obviously a new house is built? Um, when is that going to hit their tax bill? When's it going to hit their pocket? And it's there's a number of variables that go into that that you have to consider. Um, on the right part of the slide, you'll see uh, this is basically the law. The law is that the county can pick fully pick up the value um, when there's a certificate of occupancy issued or the property is habitable, whichever comes first. Um, it's not when closing occurs. Uh, it's one of these two things, certificate of occupancy or when the property first becomes habitable, they can start taxing it at that point. Um, so, but when does when do the counties in reality really pick this up? Um, it, it's a timing issue. Um, assessing officials outside of Cook probably start their assessing uh, sometime mid-year. In Cook, it's a sliding scale of different townships. So if your new construction is not habitable or CFO not issued yet, um, or if, it, if it's issued early in the year, then it's most likely the county is going to pick it up in that current tax year. If you're not habitable or CFO is not issued until mid-year, then there's a chance they may not pick it up and fully assess it that year. If your property is going to be late in the year uh, to be finished, then it's most likely they're not going to pick it up until the following year uh, to assess it. 
Now I'm talking, this is a full assessment. The county can give partial assessments. And so they can partially assess the property uh, prior to it being fully habitable or a CFO. And so you may have a property that doesn't meet, reach this mark until halfway through the year, they can assess the house for 50% of the year. Um, so there can be a partial assessment. This is just when they can fully put it on um, and, and assess it. And that's when it's going to hit, start hitting your taxes. But the key is when is it going to start hitting, hitting your tax bill? If we can get the next slide. Uh, yep. Go to the next slide. I'm showing here, you know, just an example. Your client's buying in 2024 a newly constructed house. Well, the left side here is when is assessed? When did the county pick it up? Well, if it was CFO issued in 23 or it's happened in 23, they could have picked it up in 23. Because taxes are paid in arrears, it's going to come out on the 24 tax bill in the count in the on the 23 tax bill in calendar year 24. So the same year that the client purchased they're going to see the new tax for the, the, the house. Uh, same purchase done in 2024, but the county doesn't assess it until 24. Um, thing to keep in mind is it's going to show up on the tax bill in calendar year 2025. And if you're not in Cook, it's going to be on the first installment. You'll see the impact of it. If you're in Cook, you're not going to see it until the second installment of tax bill. Next uh, scenario there is you could purchase in 2024. But they and uh, but by the way, Scott, just a question on that in the second installment. Do they try to collect for the whole year on that second installment then? Right, right. They'll collect for uh for the whole year. Yeah. Right. So they'll they what they do the is impact, like, the impact the increase they'll try to collect all in one scoop. So it's not just you don't get the six months of the impact of those taxes, they add the whole enchilada on, and then that next year it'll be divided evenly first and second installment. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Like okay. Stephanie mentioned, the first installment cooks will be just 55% of the prior year. So the prior yeah. year was only $2,000 for land. It's only you know, a little over 1000 that first installment. So you could really get popped that you second really installment. Get popped. Now, all of a sudden, that second installment is you know $25,000 all in the second installment. Um, um, and then and the third scenario I give is if, you know, you purchase it, it wasn't finished till late in 24. Um, so the county doesn't pick it up until a tax year 25. You actually won't see that tax bill until 20, the impact of that new construction until 26. And again, same scenario, second installment tax bill in Cook County is where you're going to see the big hit. Um, so that's kind of the scenarios you got to look about when, when this is going to hit. Um, so your client's not surprised if it hits in the same year they purchase, if it hits in the next year or the year after. Um, back on the last slide, there was a, an omitted. I'll just throw that in there. Um, so an omitted assessment is what happens if the county, you buy a new house, the county doesn't assess it right away. Oh, there they it is. They don't assess yeah. it in 24. They don't assess it in 23, 24, 25. And all of a sudden, you're three or four years out, and you're like, hmm, that's strange. My tax bill is still only two or $3,000. There is something called an omitted assessment. The county can go back and pick up the construction of that house. Um, and you'll pay one time with interest when that tax bill becomes due. Um, there are, you know, you have an opportunity to object to it and protest it, um, which is what we do, and, and fight it. But if, if you lose, you're going to be paying for those omitted. So there is a, a little known law in Illinois that says when there's new construction, you are supposed to send certified registered letter to the county assessing officials um, to let them know that there's this property. And if they have a form, use their form and let them know. So some people roll the dice and I don't want to let the assessor know. I'll take a chance. Um, other people don't want to be that risk averse. They can send that notice in. The good thing about it is you keep that as proof because if they do try to hit you up for an omitted assessment, that's a defense that you could wipe out the entire omitted assessment if you show them that you sent a certified registered letter and it was just their fault and not picking up the new construction. So at the very least, Scott, to, to defend yourself against a, and now you're tipping them off, you're waking them up, whatever it is, but have you ever seen these go like unbilled, you know, for a long time where people just get away with it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Okay. So yeah. especially in Cook. I mean, remember in Cook, you got one assessor for the entire county of 1.8 yeah. parcels. Um, 
outside of Cook, you have township assessors. And those township assessors have a little geographic area that they're covering. Their staff is much fall, smaller, but they're right in the circuit. They may live in the neighborhood. They may see the construction going up. So it's less likely, um, but in Cook, they can um, they can catch it. And there, there are defenses, but absent those defenses, you're going to end up paying for it. Okay. Um, Scott uh, and Stephanie, someone asked, should we appeal every time you buy a property? Hey, thanks for listening to the People Not Titles podcast. We are brought to you by our great sponsors, Land Trust Title Services, your partners for results. Yes and no. I mean, you have to evaluate it. Um, you know, it's definitely every time you buy a property, you should have, you should look at it closely or yes. have an attorney like us look at it closely um, because you want to make that evaluation is your purchase price above or below the county. And then you want to make that analysis of uniformity. You know, there are scenarios, of course, uh, where people approach us and, well, let's see, you bought it for more than the county's value. We've done the research. You're actually lower than most similar properties in your neighborhood. Be happy with your at, where you're at and don't file an appeal. And, you know, it's kind of, it's a good and bad situation. You know, the good news is you're right where you want to be um, and you don't have to pay an attorney to get there. Uh, the bad news is you're not going to get any farther. But to be honest, in our 25 years, people are so thankful for that advice to know that they can, you know, rest easy knowing that they're not overpaying on their property taxes. Yeah, so and not to, we're not doing anything sleep, not to wake the sleeping giant either, right? right. Say, hey, you know, take exactly a look. Exactly right. Yeah. Great. Okay, next evaluation. slide. Yeah, so the, then the next slide I'm talking about is renovations. Um, again, you know, if you are looking at, your client's looking at a, buy a property that's been recently renovated, um, you know, what you tell them about where property taxes are going. Well, it depends on the renovation first. I mean, just typical repairs, upkeep, that shouldn't be a taxable event. Um, if you're remodeling, um, you know, redoing some rooms, repainting, that shouldn't impact the tax bill. Um, even if you're doing a rehab, you know, a gut rehab or almost rehab, if you're not changing the footprint, not changing the square footage of the house, um, just updating it, um, typically that wouldn't be a taxable event. Now, you know, if it's over the top and there, there's, you know, gold bathtubs and, and they're like, well, then they might, they might pick that up. Um, uh, but if there's going to be a renovation that involves a, an addition, that is something that, um, you know, is going to be a taxable event. The county is going to pick up that uh, addition and it may cause a reassessment um, or at least the next time you're reassessed a higher value than it would have otherwise been. But most likely it's going to cause a, a, an immediate impact, the same as the new construction. If it's early in the year, they're likely to pick it up. If it's middle of the year, they may pick it up. If it's late in the year, they're probably not going to pick it up for that current year. They'll pick it up for the following year. And so. And how do they pick it up, Scott? Is it based on the permits? Yeah, it's going to be based on the, the permits when they should first get notice of it. And then it's the same thing as new construction. If you're outside of Cook County, you've got the local township assessors who probably see the permit, new house is going up, an addition is being made. And to be honest, they'll probably just drive by and keep up keep an update on it. Um, and Cook, they're going to rely on the permits. And so that's always, you know, either new construction or renovation. You've got to watch that closely because they may pick it up and you know fully assess you for the year even though the property is not habitable for the entire year and that could be a basis for the topic there to mention there is a vacancy relief where you know the county has assessed either a new construction or a renovation with an addition for the entire year when it wasn't habitable for the entire year and so you and scott in that in that line if there is non-permitted work and now I'm selling, right? And going, you you think, oh wow, these are the taxes. And next thing you know, that gets triggered by a new assessment or a new evaluation, right? And that could impact. So you need to watch out for that. Yeah, you definitely got to work watch out for that. It's it's you know again, when are they going to pick it up? Um, and cook, you probably not for a while. But you know, one of the things we talk about later on permits, we'll see they may pick pick it up at some point. And one of the other things to keep in mind. 
is AI is becoming part of this. Um, they can do stuff with aerial views and aerial maps that they, you know, haven't been able to do in the past when they were working on pencil and paper. And so um, it's, it's slowly working its way in um, that, you know, I, I talked to appraisers who now are measuring houses, not by getting a measuring tape out, but they're using aerial photographs. And so they can do it. This county assessing officials can do the same thing. Absolutely. And so that's not the point where it's overwhelmingly, but it's coming certainly. Okay. So uh, the, if we can go back to the slide, I'm just going to finish up that one. So a couple of things to keep in mind is, you know, the vacancy relief. If, if a client is doing an addition, um, they can get some relief if the house is uninhabitable. But the flip side is it, if you're buying a house that you see a, re a recent addition has been uh, put on, maybe the prior owner got some vacancy relief. That's only for one year. They'll do vacancy relief for one year at a time. So maybe the seller got some vacancy relief that suppressed, artificially suppressed the property taxes. Instead of being $30,000, they are only $20,000. And, you know, you've got to see, you know, are they, did they get that vacancy relief? Because otherwise your client's going to be surprised when the taxes go up to 30,000. Um, and you didn't realize that this, this vacancy relief was coming off uh, after, after the year. Uh, one other thing just to talk about briefly, there's something called a home improvement exemption as well. Uh, with a home improvement exemption, residential owner occupied property um, if you do an addition up to the first $75,000 in market value attributed to the addition uh, is exempt from property taxes. Um, and that's kind of a, a wonky thing. It's from four to six years. Um, and so you've so got is that, and Is that the idea to incentivize people to improve their property and not tax them as soon as they do? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. It, it's all based on incentivizing people to improve their properties and improve real estate overall and get better properties on the tax rolls. Um, and so and even if there is, a, Scott, I'm sorry. So even if there is unpermitted work and that work did not increase the value of the property by 75 grand, that new buyer may not be impacted by that, right? Right, right. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing to keep in mind is you were buying and someone did that is getting a home improvement exemption that's now four or five years old. That will be coming off and expiring the next time there's a reassessment. And that's okay. Got, we have a question here. It says, how can a real estate agent know if there is a vacancy tax relief that may not show on the tax bill? Is there a number to call or a website that can show this? Right. And, and Cook County... Um, Yes and no. It's very difficult with the assessor's office. The website, you can check it um, and you can see, you know, our perspective, we can see if the assessment all of a sudden changed one year and you can see what you've got to do is you've got to look into, look at the property on the assessor's website or the Cook County Board of Review. You go into the appeal section. If there was an appeal filed arguing for vacancy, you can see that, you know, it was granted in 24, so it's going to be good for 24, but it's, you know it's going to come off in 25. Same with the Cook County Board of Review, you can see it. Um, outside of Cook, you probably have to call your township assessor and ask them, you know, okay. what's the current, is this tax bill reflect 100% of value, um, is what you want to ask. Um, okay, great. I love that. That's a great question. So I have another one. Do you have anything more on that, Scott? Um, no, no. Okay. When I have a client say, that they didn't pull permits for certain things, kitchen renovation, finishing basement, et cetera, will that impact the next buyer's assessed value or does it only impact them when you're adding square footage? And I think you kind of addressed that, right? It, if it, if I think a but new basement is adding square footage, right? Uh, so there is some renovation things that don't impact, but there's some that do. Um, yeah, the, the basement, just to address that real quick since you raised it, actually improving your basement for a single family house won't change your square footage. Okay. Um, and typically in assessing, they do not include basement as living area, which is the key. Yeah. Uh, but if it's an apartment building and it's an apartment in the basement, they will include that as living area. Okay, uh, so if you build a second apartment in there or whatever it is. Right, right. 
And as far as like unpermitted work, it all is just the same as anything else. It's a matter of if and when they catch up with it. Great. Okay. Okay, last or next slide. So anyway, I, we were talking about, well, I just talked about like these things were not taxable as far as renovations, whether it's just some upkeep, a new HVAC, remodeling. I said, oh, that's not really taxable. You're putting on a new coat of paint. You're doing this, you know, a rehab, um, you know, typically not going to be taxable unless you're doing a, an addition. Um, having said that, let's talk about permits now. So it used to be fine. You take out a permit. You're adding, uh, you know, 200 square feet to a house. The county will say, okay, well, we had you down as 1,500. You're adding 200. We're going to assess you at 1,700 square feet now. Um, and that's the way, just kind of the best way they could do it, given the resources, without being able to go out and reinspect and appraise every property. Um, what we found in Cook County, at least, starting last year, but catching building speed this year, is permits of any type are kind of triggering the assessor to look at the property again and reevaluate it from a you know square footage and a value uh, from it. So you know we've had clients that have taken out permits for uh, a new fence or replace an HVAC or replace siding, a uh, new roof. And we get a surprise because we see their assessment go up. And we go on the we, we research and we find oh, the assessment, they've changed this to um, a 1,700 square foot house when it was only 15. Talk to the client. Well, I didn't do anything except for add a, add a fence. What we're finding is, is, certainly in Cook, is these permits are causing the ass uh, assessor to reluck at everything. And if they reluck at it and they realize that their 1,500 square foot house uh, measurement is incorrect, they'll change it to 1,700. Even though you only took a permit out for a new fence or to replace an HVAC, they now see that you're at 1700, so they're going to change your square footage. They're going to increase your assessment. Um, and that's di that's difficult to argue, right, Scott? So if you have a favorable assessment and you start making repairs that you don't think are going to impact the where you've uh, gained the favor, it may impact it just because they do another review, take a look, and go, "Oh, wait a second, got you on the fence." but you have that extra bedroom that we didn't count last time or that bathroom or the square footage. That's exactly right. I mean, we have a client, um, you know, we have a client that had a fire that gutted the house. And so of course permits to re, you know, rehab that and rebuild it exactly the same as it was before. Um, so this poor guy that had his fire, um, all of a sudden his assessment skyrocketed which, you know, once the house is built, you know, rebuilt, okay, we expected that, but not the skyrocket above where it was before, particularly in a nine triennial year. Well, you look into it and the county now has changed this 3,200 square foot house to 3,700 square feet. Talk to the client, well, yeah, it's always been 3,700 square feet. Okay, um, and, there, and there's not much we can do with that. I mean, we certainly argue why it should be reduced to 3,700 square feet, but, you know, clients often are coming to us and say, well, you know, either the fire thing, I didn't change anything. They can't change my square footage. Well, if it's accurate, it's accurate. That's all it is. You know, if they pick up the uh, second bedroom or third bedroom addition that they hadn't picked up before um, and you took out a permit for something completely had nothing to do with that bedroom, now they picked it up. Um, you know, on the one hand, count yourself lucky they didn't pick it up for all those years. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, we may be able to appeal on the normal appeal process, but we can't appeal saying that you shouldn't be assessing it as a 3,700 square foot when it's actually a 3,700 square foot. Yeah. And, uh, Scott, they can't bill you retroactively for the years they missed, right? That's just all of it is new assessment for the go forward. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, typically that's what they're going to do. You know, the admitted assessments I talked about before, um, you know, they're changing the law. They kind of lead some gray area that maybe they could pick up something like that, but um, it's not 100% clear. We haven't seen any assessing officials do it yet. Okay, by the uh, same token- They'll use the for like new construction or something. Yeah, we'll get into how people work with you and how that works. So I'll ask the, the next question, which is if, there, if we do win 
on the assessment, how far back do they go to refund the taxpayer the money? Or is sure. it just a new um, assessment for the go forward? Sure, sure. Typically, we are only doing appeals going forward. Okay. Um, that's the main thing that they want. Once the tax bills are out, typically it's going to be too late to do anything about those prior tax bills. So even if they've, um, you know, overvalued you, you based on, you know, whatever arguments you have, they're not going to go back and change that. You're not getting any refund. What we're doing with the appeals are trying to get future tax bills lower than they would be if we didn't do an appeal and get a reduction. So, you know, Stephanie talked about, and we talked about the impact in Cook County always show up in the second installment. And so what we're trying to do is before that second installment comes out, get your assessment reduced so it's lower than it otherwise would be. Okay. Now, there is something called the certificate of air process that you can go back for three or maybe four years. It's typically, you know, it's certificate of air. So they're, what they really are looking for is we had you down as a 4,000 square foot house. You're only 3,000. That is something through a certificate of air process that you might be able to get a refund of back taxes. And you guys do that as well. We do that as well, right? Okay, great. But it's not going to be simply a. I wasn't uniformly assessed before. Right. That that's going to get shot down immediately for a certificate um, of air. Um, and if you get your appeal in before the bill comes out, does that mean you're in below the window, or do you have to have your your do you have to have your decision? back before the bill comes out we'll have the decision from the, either the cook county assessor or cook county board of review or outside of cook whether you get it from your your county board of review you'll have that decision before tax bill comes out they can't come out with tax bills until they decide all of the appeals in the county wow they okay. need, they, yeah they need those final values just to calculate your tax rate now okay. Stephanie, you know Stephanie, i used to work for the state property tax appeal board that process is different. That one, you're going to pay your dip bill. Unfortunately, the, the state process takes three or four years. Um, but if it is successful, then you'll get a refund with interest for that reduction. So we're trying to get the reductions from the assessor and the board of review so that the clients get the relief before the tax bill comes out. They don't have to take money out of their pocket and, and pay an inflated tax bill. We get it reduced before the tax bill comes out. And yeah, definitely in Cook, there's an assessor appeal process. Outside of Cook, there's no assessor appeal process. There's only okay. a board review process. We got we got um, two questions, Scott. Yeah. One is if they put in hardwood floors where there was only carpeting, do you need a permit? And will it increase your tax? I don't need, think you need a permit for that, for hardwood floors, do you? Yeah, the uh, permits are not signed my purview, but I doubt you would need it. Okay. Um, that should not impact your property taxes, you know, yeah. unless they, you know, you take out a permit for it and they're like, oh, well, you're actually a more square feet than we, more we, square feet than we knew, but no, that should not change it. Okay. Well, uh, and I see the next one, Jessica, we'll ask, we'll talk about how to engage you at the end of the presentation. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just kind of wrapping up, um, if you go to the next slide, it's just, you know, the pitfalls and opportunities, um, you know, the pitfalls are your client sees a huge increase in their tax bill and they're coming back to you, they're coming back to the lawyer, they're coming back to everyone involved in the transaction. And why didn't you let me know that my, my property taxes were going to do this? I'm not prepared for it. Um, you know, I have a, a client now that their their monthly mortgage uh, escrow went up $2,000, went up $2,000 a month uh, mm -hmm. on construction that they weren't prepared for. Um, so the, the pitfalls are there when, uh, you know, property tax bill comes out higher than expected. Um, but it's also opportunities there, you know, as, as Steve, I'm sure we'll talk about is, you know, as long as you're knowledgeable and you can help your clients through this process with more knowledge. And so they, they have an idea of what's coming, uh, will be helpful. So, you know, use your knowledge. Um, hopefully we've helped with your knowledge today, you know, be observant, when you walk into a house and you know, wait a minute, this thing's only assessed at uh, taxes only five thousand on a three thousand square foot house. This area, this is really or something strange here. Either the the county's got the description wrong, there's a senior freeze, there's uh, uh they haven't there's a home improvement exemption, so they haven't picked up the addition yet. 
Um, there's something strange going on here that needs to be um, next step is do a little research, do a little legwork so you can let your client know that, you know, don't expect this $5,000 tax bill to stay, it is, stay as it is. Um, it, it possibly could change for any number of reasons. And that's explaining it to your client so that they have the knowledge. Um, and then ask is, you know, talk to your local township assessors outside of Cook. Cook, it's a little hard to even get to talk to anyone at the assessor's office um, or the board of review. And sometimes if you do, you might not even get the right answer. Um, so, and Cook's a little bit harder. You got to use whatever online resources you have. Um, and you, you can ask people like Stephanie and myself as well. But, you know, there, there's certainly a lot of pitfalls, but there's opportunities to, to educate um, clients. We don't have a crystal ball. Even if you contact me or Stephanie, we can't give, we can't tell you this is what the taxes are actually going to be in the future. This is when they're going to impact. We can't tell you a crystal ball. We don't have that, but we can give en enough information to make sure your clients are knowledgeable, that they're aware and ready for anything. That's great. Oh, um, so one of the uh, questions is, what is the typical cost of high? How, how does it work to engage you guys, Scott and Stephanie, for an appeal? Sure. For um, most property tax bills, uh, firms like us work on a contingency fee. Mm -hmm. So for some, there's an exception, but most will not charge any upfront fees where you're only paying a fee if we can get that assessment reduced for you. Um, if we can't get it reduced, there's no fees payable to us. We work on a contingency fee. Uh, so typically it's, you know, someone's just got reassessed. We can get that number knocked down. Um, that number's going to stay knocked down for three years. So they get three years of savings there. And for our, our firm for residential appeals is 33% of the first year estimated savings, nothing of the second or third year. Um, so if it's $1,000 of estimated savings per year, uh, we're going to charge $330. And the second year, when you save that $1,000, you owe us nothing. Third year, you owe us nothing. So strictly a contingency fee basis. Um, right. Commercial industrial property might have a different percentage, um, but that's how we work. Great. And, um, and if they want to challenge... Do they just go to the website? Well, how do they, do they call you? How do you, how do you, would you like them to engage with you? Yeah, a, an email is the easiest thing. I mean, through our our website, there is a place you can make a property tax inquiry that'll get to us as well. Um, but, you know, they can email. The email that I, I think we have above is direct comes directly to my computer. Um, so an email, phone call. If it's, you know, something a little more complicated, maybe a phone call. If it's straightforward and they want the ease of the email, we can do an email. Okay, great. Um, Scott, so to be clear, and I don't know, my my screen is freezing up a little bit. I don't know if I've frozen, but, but can you hear me fine? I, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, great. What is the deadline to appeal in Cook County this year? Right. Like Stephanie yeah. said, some of the deadlines have already passed, um, right. you know, for a good number of the townships. Probably a third of the townships, eh, actually more than that, almost half of the townships, it's too late. Over half the township is too late. Um, so we are in, in outside of Cook, I know it's probably too late in most counties. Um, so in Cook, you have, like I said, you have uh, a, a chance to appeal with the assessor. Um, that process this year started in May. Mm -hmm. If you are a house that's being reassessed, you should get notice and told that you have a deadline coming up, 30-day deadline. But okay. if you're not in a reassessment, you're not, you're not even getting notice that the deadline, you know, the, your township's open for an appeal now. So in, in Cook, they're sliding through the townships. They start the first townships in March. I, said, I should have said March. And for the assessor, they go through um, December. We're still working on some townships. Okay. And then if you're not happy with that result, you file the board of review. But again, they are sliding through the townships throughout the year. So this year they started in um, July. And they've covered about half of the townships and some townships aren't even open yet. Mm -hmm. So it's Cook. It's just kind of a sliding thing that you've just got to pay attention to. Outside of Cook, it's, again, the same thing. Um, if they apply a multiplier, then you should get notice of that. And 
you know, you have a 30 day window to start the appeal process with the board of review. So it can be as early as March to start in a current year. Um, but if you're in a different township, you may not be filing your appeal until December. Okay, great. Very helpful. Well, listen, uh, Scott and Stephanie, I just want to say thank you for your time with us and uh, your expertise. I think you're going to be a great resource to a lot of these uh, agents. Um, I think in a time period where, you know, with the NAR settlement that the agents are dealing with and all that, where we're constantly talking about what is the value that a realtor brings to a transaction, I think being able to navigate the taxes and future bills can be an X factor for you on how you position yourself in the marketplace. So I think that uh, that agents who are partnering with someone like you guys who can help them on past situations, but as well looking into the future and saying, hey, what is going to be the impact for my client if they buy this property? I notice this, this, and this, I think can be a real game changer for you know, just the uh, the job you do for the consumer. So thank you. Hey, Steve. Yes. Would you be able to go back to slide number two? I think a couple of people wanted contact information for Stephanie and Scott's firm. Yeah. So, uh, you know, for some reason, I'm just like got this revolving. Uh-oh. Uh so we lost Steve, but that's okay. I'll pick up here. <laughs> so to answer a couple of the outstanding questions, there are, um, this recording will be made available as soon as we finalize it, and it will be shared with all registrants and attendees. Uh, Stephanie and Scott, your contact information and your information will be included in an email that I'll send out. So just so the uh, people out there are aware that this is going to be available to them, and I know a lot of realtors who weren't able to make it today will definitely be watching this to learn more. And just my final plug is I've been so impressed with Scott and Stephanie. I'm using them for my own property tax appeal. So thank you. Hey, thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions or anything else we have? Yeah. Any other questions out there that we didn't answer? I'll check. Yeah. I think, I think that's it. Um. So if there's any follow-up questions, you know, you could email Steve or myself and we'll take it from there. Uh, but I think we're good to go. Yeah, I'm back. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, guys, I'm back. I don't know. I got kicked out of the meeting. So you were yeah, able we, to communi communicate. Yeah, what, what I had said, well. Steve, is we're going to follow up with everybody with the recording and contact information. Great. Hey, thanks for listening to the People Not Titles podcast. We are proudly sponsored by Land Trust Title Services. If you enjoyed the podcast, please hit the like button, please subscribe, and we'd love it if you'd share our podcast with your friends. Thanks a lot.